thank you, Alain, and uh, thank you, uh, uh, Daryl, to, uh, for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, I hope you can hear me clearly at the end. Yes? Okay, good. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. This is the first time I'm uh, visiting this building. Uh, and uh, I was recently in Oxford, so very, very pleased to be in the Mathematical Institute. Um, a little nervous, um, especially after what Alain said. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sort of dimly aware that Euler worked uh, on issues of graphs a long, long time ago, uh, maybe. Uh, but uh, so today I'll be uh, talking about, I'm going to have a lecture where, which is going to start with uh, sociology um, in the 40s and 50s of the 20th century. And uh, it's going to move forward into some online social networks. And, um, and then I'm going to uh, ask questions about how can we account for phenomena that different social scientists have been talking about. And I'm going to have a mathematical model to, um, to try and explain the, the phenomena, the law of the few. Um, this mathematical model will turn on an economic mechanism. And, and I'm going to try and convey the essence of this mechanism to you. Um, and after having done that, um, I'm going to then ask whether this mechanism actually uh, works um, as it's supposed to work by taking this model to a laboratory with human subjects. And I'm going to show you uh, some experiments that, that we've been conducting. In fact, we are still doing these experiments, and, it's, uh, and I'm going to spend a fair bit of time talking about these experiments and what we learn about these, uh, about the mathematical model from um, the findings of the experiments. Uh, and there will be things that uh, we will learn which will um, reassure us about the mathematical model, but there will also be there will also be patterns in the data which are going to um, make us question the scope of the model. And so that's the, that's the, you know, the broad outline of, of the talk. Um, and so it's going to combine social sciences, it's going to combine some mathematics, and it's going to combine experimental methods. Um, and so I hope that you will um, get a flavor of um, how economists work with mathematics, but also how they use experimental methods to um, enrich their models and, and advance the, you know, the, uh, if you like, the nature of the subject, you know, the scope of their understanding of the subject. Okay, so it's going to be methodological to some extent. It's going to combine different approaches, but it's also hopefully going to uh, raise, you know, some questions in your mind about uh, the methodology of economics, but also the specific uh, phenomenon that we're going to be talking about. So what is the law of the few? Um, so, so let me start by um, saying a few words about um, the origins of this. Um, so this really goes back to the 40s, the 1940s in, in, in the United States. And the background here is that this was a, this was a period where um, mass media was really coming into its own. Radio, television, newspapers were really coming out in a big way. And so there was this, um, and, and you can see the parallel to what's happening now uh, in a moment. But what the, the thought was that with the emergence of mass media, um, social networks of communication would become um, second order, would basically disappear. And so you will have, on the one hand, these big mass media, they will directly um, communicate, they will directly convey information to, to ordinary people who will, on the one hand, be very informed because they will have all this mass media talking to them. On the other hand, there was this worry that the mass media would be very powerful and it could indeed misinform and mislead um, ordinary citizens, ordinary consumers, because it would be so powerful. So in that context, this, um, these, um, these studies were done um, by sociologists based in uh, New York at, the, at Columbia University. 
And in particular, I'd like to draw your attention to Paul Lazarsfeld, who was a uh, Viennese-born uh, 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 sociologist who had moved to New York. And what they did in this work in the 40s, and then subsequently there's been a lot of work uh, in this field, is they essentially showed um, a very, so, so they, they, they found out um, what they later termed a two-way flow of information model of communication. What do they mean by that? They had this um, very simple sort of idea that indeed they started with the hypothesis that social networks and social communication would be becoming less and less important. Uh, but when they went and did these surveys in different parts of the United States, they found that there was this two-way flow between the mass media and a very small set of people in these cities that surveyed. And most of the people who were not actually listening to the radio or watching the television or reading the newspapers, but in fact were mostly talking to a few people in their community to inform themselves about what's happening at the world at large. And it's a small set of people who were actually um, having access to the outside world. Okay, so, so this basic observation, so in their study they looked at about 4,000 people they surveyed and they found that roughly 20% of these people were um, you know, actually really exposed to the world out, out there. And they were then communicating and um, summarizing this information they have gathered to their fellow citizens in their communities. Okay, so that's sort of um, the first sort of, uh, you know, the first step in our, um, uh, you know, in our talk today. So, so these are the two books that uh, were published, People's Choice was about how politics, political decision making, voting uh, behavior was shaped not so much by mass media, but for the vast majority of people they surveyed, it was shaped by their personal preferences, but also by uh, through their communication, their discussions with these opinion leaders in their local communities. Okay. And subsequently, in, in a book published in 1955, Personal Influence, um, Katz and Lezitzwell then expanded the scope of their study beyond politics to dress cinema, um, you know, wide variety of decisions people make in day-to-day -day life, and how it's not just in politics, but also in this many different spheres of life, uh, ordinary citizens, ordinary consumers were um, not really directly exposed to the mass media, but indeed they had these intermediaries a very small set of intermediaries. So moving forward, um, if you now move to, you know, 2016, 2017, um, I want to give you a sense that this idea that a very small fraction of people um, have access somehow to lots and lots of information and are indeed being followed and watched by the rest of the population, uh, to some extent that sort of pattern is also reflected you know, in this very high level summary of Twitter. Um, so this is, a, you know, this is a very, very high level sort of uh, picture, but you get against the sense that, you know, for instance, there are over a billion people who have accounts, but almost half of them have never sent a tweet. So in other words, more than half of them have been quite um, pass passive okay, in this community. The average number of people who follow, supposing I have an account, the average number of people who are listening to my tweets is 208, which is quite a large number. But at the same time, we know that, you know, about one, th one third, one fourth of the, one third of the accounts, about 400 million accounts have no followers at all. Okay, so no one's actually following them. And on the other hand, there are people we all know who, you know, this is one person, Katy Perry, but we have, uh, you know, we have Donald Trump who is being followed by millions of people. Okay, so this is another instance of a world which has, it's very large and a very few um, account holders, very few people in fact have a lot of connections. Most people have no connections at all. So that's another instance of this feature of the law of the few. So here's another example. This is taken from uh, Nutella, which is an online forum. 
And it's a typical example of peer-to-peer -peer networks. Uh, you, could, you could think you could take your favorite peer-to-peer -peer network, you could take forums or blogs, and they have this feature that, uh, just to be very brief here, they have this feature that very small fraction in this instance, it's 25% of the people on this, uh, on this uh, network provide files. Um, and 70%, and you know, almost two thirds of the people provide no files at all. So this is a world in which um, most of the activity is being, most of the goods, the, the information, the files are being provided by a very, very small fraction, you know, roughly 25% of the network. Okay, so this is another instance of uh, what I will refer to as the law of the few. So here's a very, um, very sort of informal uh, summary of the law of the few. And what it says is you take any large social group um, and, and let's think about information as the main um, objective of this, information sharing as the main objective of this group. Uh, the law of the few says uh, a majority of individuals, it could be, you know, uh, 80 or even more than 80% of them, get most of their information uh, from the remaining 20% who are the active acquirers or purchasers, purchasers of information. And what is interesting is when, you know, a number of researchers over the last 50 years have looked at the characteristics, the demographic, the economic characteristics of people who are influencers, who are opinion leaders. And what's interesting is that there are only relatively minor observable differences between the, the few and the others, which makes it you know, puzzling. Why is it that you see this very sharp differentiation? Why is it that you see this specialization in, and, um, in these uh, communities? Okay, so, so that's the background um, to the mathematical model that I want to now put up. And this expression law of the few uh, I borrowed from um, a very, very nice, very readable book by Malcolm Gladwell, which many of you have probably seen, uh, The Tipping Point. Uh, one of the chapters in his, this book has this title, The Law of the Few, and that's, the, that's where we borrowed this, um, uh, this sort of title for this talk and also for a paper I wrote some years ago. So what I'm going to do in the next um, 15 minutes or so uh, of uh, 15 or 20 minutes is going to walk you through uh, a mathematical model. Um, the goal of this model would be to develop a very simple, um, sort of develop some ideas, building off a very simple economic intuition. When I, ha when I need some information to make a decision, whether it's to vote for someone or to buy a computer or to buy a pair of shoes, um, I can always invest time and I can buy magazines, I can buy magazines, I can invest time on, online and I can inform myself uh, about what the options are, what, what the trade-offs are, but I can also connect to others who are informed, who have informed themselves. And that, of course, would mean I would have to form links with them, I would have to take time, uh, to talk to them, which is also, also costly. Okay, so um, the key here is that I can inform myself either by directly, personally buying information or by talking to others who may have bought some information, who may be informed. And so there are two activities here which are both costly, um, and I want to kind of decide, make a decision, how much should I invest in one versus how much should I invest in the other. Okay, so once I lay out this model, um, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to ask, um, it only makes sense for me to um, link to you if you, if you are informed. In other words, I, my linking behavior will be very much uh, shaped by how much activity others have around them. Okay? Um, and also, if it may be that Alain is not himself reading newspapers, he's, he's, he's himself not actually watching television, but it may be that he's very well connected with others who's actually, who are very active. So I might connect to Alain not because he's himself buying information, but because he's very well connected to others who are doing so. Okay, so I need to keep in mind the network structure that's emerging and the activity level of others. And, and that's going to help um, 
you know, tell me what I should be doing. How much information should I be buying? And how much should I be linking with others? And then, of course, we are interested in understanding what's going to be the overall architecture of the network that's going to arise. And finally, of course, we are especially interested in understanding whether people are going to make well-informed decisions. Are they going to vote for the right person? Are they going to buy the right product? Or are they going to land up being very poorly informed at the end of the day? Um, OK, so those are the kinds of questions uh, we want to address. So this is, there are going to be a few slides with some notation and, and some concepts. Um, and uh, you know, this is the first time I'm giving a public lecture in a mathematics institute. So I'm going to see whether this is going to be the right level of mathematics. So, so this is a model where um, there are many people. Okay? And I think I would like you to imagine hundreds, maybe thousands of people. Uh, what's happening is that each person Okay, so each person is making two choices. Um, each person is deciding um, how much information to buy, and that's captured by uh, this. Does this work? Yeah. Okay, that's captured by this number xi. So this is the information that I buy, and then. Uh, that costs me C of xi. C is a positive real number, and it says something about how much time I put in, or how many magazines I buy, and so forth. Then there is the linking that I do. Um, and I create GI links. Okay? And so these are links I create with um, the other members of this community. And so it's going to be a vector. I'm just, I'm being, this is a shorthand. So for each link I create, um, I'm going to have the, the way the links are created, um, as, as you can sort of make out from this expression here, it's saying that as long as one of us, um, I or J, one of us creates a link, the link is created. And so now for person I, the number of links he has is, um, you know, are, are these links that he has created. And for each of the links, he pays a price, and that's given by K. So the only item here, the only bit I haven't explained, is this function f. So what is f? f is giving me an idea about how valuable the information I have bought xi, and how valuable is the information that I'm getting for my neighbors, the people I have links with. Okay, so that's xj for the effort uh, by my, you know, that my neighbors are exerting. So what? I'm going to assume is that f is the more information I have, the happier I am. Uh, but of course, as I get more and more information, the marginal return, the marginal value of additional information is falling. And so I, I'm assuming that f is concave. Okay, so it's a sort of, I'm going to put up some pictures to, to illustrate what f looks like. Uh, but that's the essence of the model. Okay, and, and people are going to make these choices simultaneously. And, um, and just to recall, I want to understand how much xi should I be choosing and how many links should I be creating. So the way we solve models like this in economics is we postulate that people are going to do trial and error, and they're going to try and figure out what to do. Maybe they will link with others, and they will find these other people are actually completely passive. So it's a waste of time to link with them. Maybe they will buy a lot of information, and they will then find out there are a lot of other people buying information, and it would be more economical, cheaper, to link with these people rather than buy information oneself. So, so there would be all these trial and error, some experimentation going on. And at the end of the process, we hope over time, people are going to settle into some pattern. And we want to understand what that pattern will be, which will be stable. And that is what is a um, way to think about Nash equilibrium. This is named after a famous mathematician, John Nash. And the idea here is um, a, a profile of x's and g's, so a network and information acquisition, constitute a Nash equilibrium. If given what others are doing, I'm happy doing what I have chosen to do. 
Okay, so, so, that's, so in some sense, I don't have any reason to want to change my behavior. So it's a stable uh, configuration, if you like, in that sense. So in a paper with Andrea Gagliotti, we proved this theorem. Um, and, and, and I'll go through the intuition, some ideas underlying the theorem. But let me just uh, sort of read out the theorem. It says something quite, um, quite sharp and quite, quite quite precise, it says that any Nash equilibrium of the game I described will have this law of the few property. In, in other words, the network will have a core periphery structure. Uh, and I'll show you these networks in a moment. The core is the people who are active. They are buying information. Um, the periphery is constituted of people who buy no information at all. And they simply link with the core. And finally, the core, the, the people who are buying information, that's going to be a very small set of people, and it's going to become negligible as the population grows. Okay, so that's going to be the, that's the prediction of this model. So this is what, um, uh, you know, a core periphery network looks like. So on the left, I have a network where there are three core nodes. Each of them is buying five units of information. And on the right, I have a core where there's just one person who's buying information. Okay? And notice that in both cases, the core is buying 15 units of information. Everybody else uh, is buying zero units of information, and they're simply linking with the core uh, players. Okay? So that's a, uh, these are two simple examples of um, core periphery networks. Uh, it's just to reiterate, it's just the core which is buying information, and they are specializing in that. Okay, so the vast majority of people in this community are, um, is not buying any information. It's just linking with the, with the core. So what are the ideas behind the, why is it that um, any stable configuration is going to have a core periphery structure, is going to have this law of the few property? Okay, so I'm just going to walk you through the main steps of the proof. Um, and before that, let me just pause and just take some, take some water. Okay, so the first observation in the proof is to note that we have this number, which I will call by hat, which is the point at which the marginal return to information um, given by f prime of y hat is exactly equal to the cost of buying information, which is given by c. Okay, so imagine I were by myself in this world. Then this is exactly the information I would buy. I would buy y hat, and I would be content, because f is a concave function. So if I bought any more than y hat, my marginal return would be smaller than the cost of buying information. And if I bought any less, then I would be able to do better by buying a little more. Okay, so that's the first observation. This also means that in any equilibrium, it must be the case that I must be getting access to at least y hat. Because if it were the case that I'm getting access to less than y hat, I could always do better by buying some information myself. Okay, so that's the first thing to, to note. Okay, what's going to be really surprising in this model is going to be the property that not only must everyone access y hat, but it's going to be true that the society put together will buy exactly y hat of information, independently of the size of the society. Okay, so that's quite dramatic. And, and we will see later that it's incredibly inefficient. Okay, so, so why is it that um, put together, people will buy y hat. Okay, so, that's, uh, so you should bear that in mind. And we are going to, at the end of the proof, you will see why that has to be the case. OK, the other point to note is that it may be that I have connected to people who are buying um, a lot of information. And, and, and I don't buy any information. So it may be that I actually access a lot more than y hat. And I don't mind it, because I'm not buying any information myself. So this f prime of i hat doesn't come into play at all. Okay. 
But it must be the case that if I'm buying information myself and I'm linked to Anna, then it must be the case that I must be accessing exactly Y hat. Why is that? Well, I'm linked to him, he's buying some information. If I were getting together with him more than Y hat, I could lower my own purchase of information. And I would be better off because if I were getting more than Y hat, the marginal return would be smaller than C, the cost of buying information. So it follows that if A is acquiring information and he's linked to B, he must ex access exactly Y hat. Okay. Now, the next point to note is, if I were to form a link with Alain, the link costs me K. So I should only form a link with him if he is buying enough information. Because if he were buying very little information, linking with him would not be economically justified. It would be better for me to delete the link and buy the information myself. So it must be the case that if I link with Alain, that means the value of the information he's providing me is more than the cost of linking K. But if that's true for me, it must be true for everyone else. So if I link with him, so must everyone else link with him. Okay, so that's a key observation driving us towards the core periphery structure. Finally, note that if I buy some information and Alain buys some information, we are linked, anyone else who buys information must also be linked to him, okay, because of the earlier argument. Okay, because if I find it attractive to link with him, so must everyone else. In particular, everyone else who buys information should also want to link to him. But that implies that everyone who is buying information is linked to Alain and is linked amongst themselves. But from point, the second bullet point, we know if that were the case, it, then it implies that all the people who are buying information are linked amongst themselves and the total information they are accessing is exactly Y hat. So that more or less gives us the proof that the total information in society must be Y hat. And we have not used the number of people here at any point. Okay, so you can now begin to see that if Y hat is the total information acquired, anyone in the society who has not bought information must be linked with everyone who has bought information. Because from the first bullet point, everyone must be accessing at least Y hat. So we have completed the argument that we, you know, the statement of the, 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 the theorem, um, we have a core group. Um, everyone's linked to the core group. The core group itself is putting together Y hat. And the final point, the fraction of core members is negligible. This follows from this um, step, the second, the, the bullet point, the second from the bottom. If I'm going to buy information, if I'm going to link with Alain, I pay K, he must be buying a certain minimum amount of information. But we know that the total amount of information is Y hat. Since he's buying a certain minimum amount, I have basically got an upper bound on the number of people who are buying information in the society. Okay? And this upper bound is independent of the number of people in society. And therefore it follows that the core is going to shrink as the population grows. So that's the, uh, basically the proof of this theorem. Now, moving on to this whole idea, a key idea, for instance, in the current uh, political climate, a key idea and a, a notion that you, know, you must have heard and, and read is this whole idea of fake news. Okay, is this idea that somehow people are not informed um, when they're making important political decisions. Now, it's hard to know whether that's true or not, but we can ask ourselves in a community where people are buying information, linking with others, trying to inform themselves to make the right decision, whether enough information is going to be acquired. Okay. And so one way of thinking about that is to um, think about social welfare. Okay. What, what do I mean by that? I'm thinking about everyone in this community okay, has this payoff function. Um, up here, this pi, pi i, and so what I can do, very, very sort of uh, simplistic, what I could do is I could say the society is doing the right thing if it's maximizing the payoff of all the people put together. Okay. Um, 
And so that's the idea that I'm going to um, I'm going to just assume that social welfare is given by the sum of the payoffs. And, and then I'm just going to ask, what's the outcome that maximizes the sum total of payoffs in this community? Okay. So, the, so the key observation, OK, and, and before going into the statement of the proof here, so the key observation is you can begin to see what the issue is by looking at the picture on the right. Okay, so what's happening in this equilibrium is that there is this person in the center. He's buying 15 units of information. It is an equilibrium because y hat is 15. Okay, so I buy, I'm entirely self-interested in, um, in this setting. So I'm equating f prime of y hat to c which is the marginal cost. So I'm equating my private gain to my private cost. And it's equated at y hat equals 15. Okay. But what's happening, of course, in this community is when I'm buying 15 units, it's not only me who's gaining from this information, who's benefiting, but everyone else who's connecting to me. But I'm not taking that into account. I'm only looking at f prime, which is my marginal, private marginal benefit from this information. And I'm equating that to the private marginal cost. What I should be doing is I should be looking at all the people who are connected to me, which in this case is of the order of n, because there are n people in this community. And so I should be looking at n times f prime, not just f prime. Okay? And so that's really the key to understanding this proposition. Um, what we want in the simple setting of a Hubspoke network or a star network is that we want the central active player to be equating um, n of f prime to c. Okay. Now you can see, notice that f is a concave function. So if I now begin to think about what does it mean to have n times f prime rather than f prime, you can see that it would immediately mean that this f prime would have to be a lot smaller in the social welfare case compared to the equilibrium case. For f prime to be a lot smaller means, since f is concave, that f tilde is going to be a lot smaller than the equilibrium choice. Okay. Um, sorry, would be a lot larger. Okay, that's how I would lower f prime by making f y tilde a lot larger. Okay. So that's really the crux of the welfare analysis. It's saying that the socially optimal outcome is a hub spoke network with a single hub. A core is a singleton. And the hub chooses y tilde, where y tilde solves this equation. So you can, you can straight away see that the hub is going to underinvest. And this underinvestment is going to grow with the size of the population. Okay, so we expect um, um, the welfare loss to get larger and larger in this information society as the society gets grows. Okay. So we're going to take these uh, background results and uh, I'm going to make uh, one uh, very quick sort of uh, very quick um, extension of the model just to give you a feel of how the model can be naturally extended. What I've done here is I have added um, not just my neighbors, I've added the neighbors of my neighbors. Okay, so I gain value from Alain, but he's connected to Dairol, and I get some information from him as well. That's what, uh, for the rest, everything here is as before. And um, what we get here are, in addition to the earlier core periphery equilibrium where the core is active, here you can get a pure connector outcome. So this is a central guy uh, who's totally inactive himself, but he's wonderfully well connected. So I go and talk to someone who's a hub. He doesn't buy information himself, but everyone talks to him. So he's very well informed. Okay. So that's the idea of a pure connector, a passive core. That's a new phenomenon that you can get in a world with indirect um, flow of information. So these are the background, so the mathematical results. And so let me just summarize this before moving to the experiment. 
So what we've got here is a very simple and fairly intuitive um, mechanism, an economic mechanism that generates the law of the few. Um, in addition, it also gives you some sense of the inefficiencies, the, um, the problems with this framework, you know, the inadequacy of information that will be bought in this, in this community. So what we want to do is we want to ask whether this model captures human behavior. Okay. And um, I'm going to now, um, I have about 15 minutes, and I'm going to walk you through a set of experiments we have done to give you a sense of whether people respond to these trade-offs whether it leads to specialization, the law of the few, and uh, we will also learn a bit about the welfare properties of... Uh... So this is going to be work, uh, ongoing work, um, joint with uh, Sing Ju Choi, who's in Seoul, and Frederick Mosson, who's uh, a postdoctoral fellow with me in Cambridge. Um, so let me just um, very briefly say a few words about the experiment. Um, and so uh, I imagine many of you are familiar with experimental methods in, um, in the social sciences, but what I just want to say here very briefly is first of all, that this is going to be a large scale experiment in network formation because we have up to 50 subjects um, and we are now going to do experiments with 100 subjects and you will see that scale is going to be an important factor. I've already said a few words about how scale is going to magnify the inefficiencies um, of behavior, but we will see it's also going to have important implications for um, behavior in interesting ways that we will see in a moment. So what we do in these experiments uh, is that we're going to have people um, buy information and form links with each other over six minutes. Okay, and we will have them, I'll show you uh, give you a tutorial on how this experiment works. Um, and at the start of every round, people will be assigned a random, randomly they will be assigned an identity number. And so across rounds, they will be mixing, okay, just to... Um, so, so we've... Let me give you an example of the F function. So this is the returns function. Um, with this returns function, um, you can... I'm going to look at a cost of buying information C, and with, if I put in substitute C into the, this payoff function and I solve for y hat, I get nine. Okay, so that's the equilibrium prediction. And, and remember, this does not depend on the number of um, subjects. Okay, so it's always going to be nine. Um, the cost of linking is 95, which is pretty high, um, and we will see what it means in particular is that I only want to form at most one link. Yes, that's for simplicity. So the network will be very sparse. Um, and finally, the F function, this is the functional form. Um, and, and in particular, that we have written it, it's for simplicity. So as long as, as, long as the effort is below 14, it's, it's a nice concave function. And above 14, it sort of becomes linear. Okay, so this is a typical uh, screen shot from the experiment. Um, what's happening here is um, you have this player um, in yellow, and uh, he's, I've called him me, and he's doing 14 units of effort. Uh, there are many people who have linked with, with me, and uh, those arrows in the links indicate the directionality, who's forming links with whom. And there are all these people on the right-hand side of the screen who I don't have links with, and in fact, I'm more than three links away. So on the left screen, um, you see that uh, there is me here, and I've got a one link, a two, second link, and a third link. So I'm looking at my three neighborhood, and on the right are all the people who are outside my three neighborhood. Okay, so, and I'm putting in some effort, um, uh, which is 14 units, and so I'm getting, you know, and I've formed I formed a link, uh, you know, I've, and so once I work out the net earnings, I get 37 points. Okay. Um, the other feature of this experiment is that the size of the circle, uh, the size of the node indicates the axis, whereas the darkness indicates the individual effort people are putting in. Okay. 
So let me try. So let me try and show you how um, subjects play this game. Okay, so this is a situation where this is the tutorial for the subjects, and this is me. And what I could do is I could increase my effort. So I click here, and I have put in seven units of effort, and I've become bigger because I've got more access to information. Um, and so my payoff is 77 points. Um, and now I can click on, let's say, Mr. One, and link with him. And when I do that, this is the network I have. And notice that it's the local network, which is up to three, three neighborhoods. The first neighborhood, second neighborhood, third neighborhood. Okay, so that's the way the, um, um, you know, the thing, this evolves. Okay. So what's the prediction given these parameters? The prediction of the theoretical model is the single hub spoke network where the hub does nine, everybody else does zero. And, um, and the payoffs, the equilibrium payoffs, will be very similar for the hub and the spoke. They're roughly 80. So it's 85 for the spoke and 81 for the hub. So the hub is earning slightly less. Okay, so I'm going to now give you a sense of what happens in this experiment before summarizing the results. Okay. Oops. I'm going to run a small movie uh, where you will begin to see how So this will take about a minute. So the dark nodes are the large effort nodes. And you can see they are doing 20. So it's really big and it's dark. And as I see all these people, I start linking with them. Um, and these are the dynamics in real time. And you see this yellow um, node, which is doing 20 units of effort, which is the maximum allowed. Um, and gradually, people are linking with this node. Uh, but it's still, uh, you know, evolving. The network is sort of uh, evolving. And it's quite confused at this point. And you should keep the yellow node. Um, you know, keep your eye on the yellow node, and he's still, but you see now he's sort of, there's someone else who has become more attractive. There's lots of linking, and there are these highly active nodes. You see at this point, there are a lot of active nodes because they are dark, and they're putting in a lot of work. Uh, they're all doing 20. So this is not a world with a lot of specialization. Um, So this is within one round. Um, this is uh, each round is roughly six minutes, and I'm showing you. Um, yes, it's in, in semi-continuous semi time. Cycle. Yes, I can increase my effort. I can link. I can delete my links, and um, so, so you see that. What's interesting is that 13 has gone to zero effort, but all these people have linked with him, and then suddenly people realize it's a bad idea to link with them. And you see that they are now abandoning him one by one. And they're going off to link with Mr. 14. Okay. Um, and you see all these sort of links pointing to 14. And he started shirking. He was doing 20, but he's not doing 18. And, um, but you, know, you can see. And you can see that the dark nodes, the, 
very many fewer dark nodes. Specialization is emerging as we go along. There are just four people, I think, were really working hard. Everyone else is just linking with these hard-working nodes. 14 has now shrunk, you know, gone off and gone off to zero. Okay. He's completely, he's shirking fully. Right? And of course, people will now start abandoning him and go to someone else. Uh, nothing much happens. So I'm just replaying the round. This is one round. This is one yeah, minute. When the round is over. So this is essentially trying to collect new. This is collecting. Take a break or? It's the same people. So we have six rounds, and each of them is six minutes. And so for a group of 50 people, you have, you know, uh, yeah, you have six rounds. And this is just a way to give them. Uh, we randomly reassign their ID numbers. Oh, I see. Yeah, that's the main change. Okay, but you see now there are just two people who are active, maybe three, uh, maybe four, but everyone else is passive. They're just linking. Okay. Um, you do have a few isolated nodes, yes, but you can see it's very few. Most people are connected. Okay. Uh, and they are doing nine. Remember, that was the... They're just bought nine and they're staying put. For some reason, no one has noticed they're there. Okay. But, uh, but see, but now if you look at this community, there are a few people doing nine or 10, but everyone else is doing zero or one. Okay. So you're, um, and you can see the emergence of a core. You can see the emergence of specialization. And, um, you know, and, and these are the sort of features that we will um, pick up when we start doing the uh, statistical analysis. Okay. So, okay, I think I'm. So now you see um, this, this person in the center, and he's got most of the links. Uh, there's one other person below who's doing, who's doing 11, uh, but player 35 is doing, I think, 16, and he's essentially got everyone linked to him. Okay, so that's, that gives you a flavor of what happens in this experiment. Okay. So we're going to look at specialization. And you see this very, very clearly here. Most people are doing no effort at all. This is the average effort information purchase. Um, and this is especially true in the n equal to 50 where more than 50% of the people are doing, basically, they're not buying any information at all. Okay. And so you see this very nice 80-20 rule. Some of you might have read about this um, in, you know, if you have an economics background. But what you see here is on the x-axis, um, I'm looking at the cumulative share of people from the lowest to highest effort. On the y-axis, I'm looking at cumulative share of efforts. And what I'd like you to focus on is, supposing I look at 80% of the lowest effort people, you see out here they're providing barely 20% of the efforts uh, in the large uh, group. And if I look at the smallest group, um, n equal to 4, uh, you see that, in, in fact, it's a lot uh, more pronounced as I go into larger groups. Okay, so. So that's the first uh, demonstration of the specialization in effort. Um, and you see this again with the, if I look at this picture here, I see that this is another way of looking at the data. And when you look at this picture, you see that for the n equal to 50 um, experiment, uh, more than 50% of the subjects have done, essentially are doing zero information purchase. On the other hand, you have almost 10% of the subjects who are doing almost 20 units of purchase. Okay, this, notice that this is wildly out of the prediction. The prediction was nine units. Okay, they should never be buying more than nine because privately, the marginal return beyond nine falls below C. So there's no reason to be buying beyond nine units. Okay, and yet you have clearly, you know, a, a fair number of people, maybe five to 10% buying, you know, close to 20 units of information, which, um, of course, never happens with eight subjects. 
Okay, so with eight subjects, pretty much no one buys more than 10 units. That's the red line. The other interesting feature of this um, experiment, which was also true in the theoretical model, is that access is basically very equal. Most people are getting access to the same amount of information. Okay, that's being captured. If it were perfectly equal, you would get the lines matching the 45 degrees line, but it's pretty close to 45 degrees. Okay, so so it's, it's a very, very egalitarian society in terms of information access. Now we look at the network, okay, and what we see here is even more striking than the information purchase. Um, if you look at the, um, the blue line, you see that, um, you know, 80% of the uh, subjects if on, along the x-axis, 80% of the subjects are um, getting barely 10% of the links. So barely most of the society, 80% of the society, is barely getting 10% of the followers, if you like. Um, and so this is even more uh, specialized, more unequal than the purchase of information. And you see this in this, another way to look at this data is to look at the cumulative distribution. And you see here that, um, you know, basically more than 95% of people are um, uh, hardly getting any links at all. Okay. So, so almost all the incoming links in this society are to less than 5% of the society. So now what I wanted to do was to look at um, the, look a little more closely at the, um, the hubs and how much information do they buy and how does that vary with the number of subjects. So a key, um, you know, key feature of this um, experiment is this particular picture. Okay, there are all these people who are buying way, way too much information. Okay, they shouldn't be buying, no one should be buying more than nine. Here you have a lot of people buying, you know, a lot of information. Okay, so the question is, how does that vary with the group size? And this picture begins to give you a first impression um, of this, you know, of this excess sort of purchase of information, and this one is even better. This is people buying more than 15 units of information, and what you see here is in the, in the smaller group experiments, um, you know, the red one is, I think, probably the best one to look at. There's basically almost no one buying more than 15 units, whereas in the large group experiments with 50 subjects, you have almost 10% of the subjects buying you know, in excess of 15 units, which is widely beyond what the theory would predict. It's widely beyond what is individually rational. Okay. So that's the, um, you know, that's the big question. Why is it that people are doing this? Okay. And the consequence of that is this picture here, um, which tells you that people who are not buying any information, who are spokes, who are just linking, are the red guys, and they are earning a lot more um, than the equilibrium would predict, and they are earning a lot more than the hubs. Remember, the prediction was the hubs should be earning roughly 80, and the spokes should be earning roughly 80, a little more than them. Okay. What you see in the data here is that the spokes uh, are earning a lot more, and they're earning a lot more because the hubs are buying so much information. It's not surprising, they're earning more. What's more puzzling, why is it the hubs are earning so much less? You know, they're earning almost 30 to 40 percent less than the prediction. Okay, so, so that's sort of the uh, big puzzle. And you see, when you look at the welfare turning, you know, finally to the welfare question, you get the opposite, um, you know, picture. Because the hubs are buying so much information, everybody is accessing more information than they would have been accessing in equilibrium. And so you see that the average payoffs are larger. The, this black line is the theoretical prediction. And so because people are buying a lot more information than they should be buying, everybody else is benefiting you know, very significantly. And so the payoffs are a lot higher than the equilibrium prediction. And they are a lot lower in the small subject experiments. So expanding the group size is actually good for welfare. Um, you know, and this is just aggregating that 
uh, what you see here is that in the small group experiments, payoffs are below the equilibrium prediction. So already we know the equilibrium is bad, but behavior is worse than the equilibrium. Whereas here with the large group, um, behavior is, you know, because of the excess information purchase relative to equilibrium, total welfare is a lot higher than, um, than the equilibrium prediction. So I think I'm out of time. Um, so what I've tried to do is, is to uh, give you a feel of how um, economists work on problems relating to networks, how they look at social phenomena, which is you know, important phenomena like the specialization in effort and uh, network structure that emerges from this specialization, develop mathematical models to understand what the mechanisms are. Um, an important feature of um, the work economists do is ask questions about welfare. And so in the talk today, I've given you a sense of how individual uh, motivations and their behavior could be out of line with what could be, what would be collectively desirable. Okay. And then we want to understand whether these models um, are accurate as, as are good ways of thinking about how people actually behave. And increasingly, economists um, conduct experiments, uh, both in the laboratory, but also in the field, and, and indeed more and more uh, in the field. And the idea is we want to ask whether the mechanisms that we have developed, we've um, explored in our mathematical models, in fact work, to what extent they work, and to what extent they are not quite capturing what drives human beings. And so what we, what we saw in these experiments today was um, the specialization that was predicted by the model is very much evident in the experiments. You get lots of specialization in information purchase. You get a lot of specialization in uh, linking. Uh, uh, but in terms of the exact magnitude of information purchase, um, you see that um, behavior in these experiments is clearly out of line with, uh, you know, with, with the models. Uh, people are being driven somehow to become hubs, and to become hubs, they, have to, they seem to exert far more effort than they really should be doing. Um, and that leads them to earn a lot less than they should be doing. But it, on the other hand, it's, it has this benefit that it makes everyone else better off. And in the aggregate, it, it could be a good thing. So the, the puzzle for us you know, as, as experimenters and as theorists then is what is it that's driving the hubs to, do, to make the effort that they do? And is it that they don't understand what's happening? Uh, they don't understand the payoffs? Or is it that they are driven by an urge to become hubs? You know, uh, and they have to get pleasure, or they get happiness, or they feel good about being hubs. Um, so this is not a world in which hubs are being paid anything by anyone. So they want to be hubs for reasons which we don't fully understand. So it's sort of very much um, you know, ongoing work. And the next step in our um, project is going to be to look more closely at the data to understand whether the hubs are not understanding their payoffs or they somehow have other motivations, and if so, develop richer models, uh, mathematical models, that can capture these other motivations that hubs might have. Okay, I'm going to stop at this point.